Hi everyone and welcome to the Neil Haley Show. Two great exciting guests. Again, we're going to go to my website, tolltitter.net for more information. Twitter, tolltitter, Neil S. Haley, Facebook, LinkedIn, Neil Haley, Instagram, tolltitter, Pinterest, Neil Haley, and Google Plus, Neil Haley. And let the, the fun continue. I love working with Triumph Books and the great authors, Triumph Books. And what I kind of try to pick teams that I do like, or at one point like, even though I'm a Pittsburgh guy, I went to Western Maryland College, which is McDaniel College, for one year. And I spent my day at Candom Yards many a times when it first opened up. So I'm excited to welcome the program. Author of 100 Things the Orioles Should Know and Do Before They Die, Dan Conley. Dan, thanks for calling. And Candom Yards is a great place to watch a baseball game, isn't it? No question. I mean, I, you know, I've had the, uh, I guess, the good fortune, I would say, to be able to do that for 15 years, to have my office seat be Candom Yards press box. And uh, it's a pretty special place. And actually, in the book, we had to order, or I had to order at least the first 25 really in, in what I thought was the most important things about Orioles history. And, uh, you know, and obviously there's a lot of great players in that. Uh, but to me, number seven, which is, you know, obviously in the top ten, even before a couple of Hall of Famers, is Camden Yards. It's that important oh. to the Orioles, that important to Baltimore. Um, just a, you know, a great place. And it really did is ballpark. You know, as you know, as, as a Pittsburgh guy, it really did change the way – you know, ballparks are created and where they're located and how they look. Um, you know, and there's been so many replicas now of Camden Yards or, or kind of similar uh, stadiums and structures to Camden Yards now. Yeah, no, it's very interesting when you talk about Camden Yards. And what I love is the wall. I mean, the, you walk into that park, sorry, PNC Park, it's not Camden Yards. When the, the, Camden Yards was built probably, I think, a year before PNC Park or maybe two, when, but when I went to that ballpark, and I walked in, and you could just see just how it's just built, and it just, it just, it's unlike any other ballpark. Describe it. I mean, specifically when you walk in, it just, it feels so old time. You know, they try to do that with uh, the Jake and, and PNC Park, but it's not like Camden Yards, in my opinion. Well, I, I think it's probably because Camden Yards was the first. I mean, it was the right. first, what they call, retro ballpark. And I think that, you know, from that point on, once you have something that, that is so original, even the ones that are nice, and PNC is a beautiful park. It um, is, yeah. I, I love the one in San Francisco as well. They're two of my favorites. Um, and they have some similar you know, some similarities to Camden Yards. But Camden Yards is the first, and that's the one that you really kind of look to and gravitate toward, and it had that old-time feel. And it's funny because in the book I mentioned that, you know, when they first were doing the design for Camden Yards, right. they were looking at something similar to the new Comiskey Park. Um, it was done by the same designers, and I don't know if you've ever been there, but it, it doesn't compare to, to the newer ballparks, obviously, the ones that were built after it. And, you know, uh, several different people, Larry Lucchino, Janet Marie Smith, they looked at this, and they did not like that idea of, you know, another large structure that, you know, is real high up, and it's kind of different. It looks like almost like it was, you know, thrown into the city. They wanted something to kind of build around the city. Exactly. And obviously, the, the B&O warehouse wall that you're referring to um, is one of the largest, you know, free, freestanding brick structures um, on the East Coast. And to have it, it really, it looked like almost the right field wall. Now, it's not. And it, it, one of the, uh, the the chapters in here is how everyone thought that someone would hit home runs off of that wall. And they even have plexiglass in the, uh, in the, in the first, I think, bottom four rows of bottom four levels. And no one's come close to actually hitting it in the fly in a ball game. The only time it's actually been hit in the fly on a televised situation was when Ken Griffey Jr. did it um, in the All Star, in the All Star game home run derby. So, but it looks, it looms over Camden Yards, and it, you know, it, it really is a big piece of Baltimore history as well. Um, in fact, the 1954 Orioles, when they, you know, the very first time they were Orioles, they got to Baltimore from a trip from Detroit. They were getting ready to play their first home game in uh, at Memorial Stadium, and they arrived at Camden Station. So, I mean, there's so many ties to the history of the Baltimore Orioles just in that building alone. Exactly. And to have that as part of the, you know, of the, the structure is fantastic. And to watch a ball game during the, the day at Canham Yards, it's unlike anything else. I mean, I, we, it was funny. Every time I spent my college days, hey, let's go out to the ballpark or let's go on the weekend and enjoy. And this is when the Orioles started to start winning, started winning again. You know, they were down, but I, I love just the tradition of that old ballpark. And when that wall is the coolest thing. And it kind of reminds me of every of uh, certain ballparks. And you remember, you know, you think of Wrigley Field. You think of you think of the great, the monster wall 
in Boston, and you, and you also think of PNC Park and how they're able to hit the ball into the water, or you think of the old Royal Stadium with the waterfall. That's the kind of thing that makes it so different, and it makes it so fun and unique for that baseball park, for sure. Now, if we were going down the list of great Orioles, I think that you, you, you got to first go with Ripken, for sure, Cal Ripken Jr., and uh, in your years of covering the Orioles and stuff like that, did you ever have a, you've had conversations about Cal, haven't you? Yeah, actually, my his Cal's last year uh, with the Orioles was 2001, which is my first year covering. So I covered him his whole final season. Wow, I um, okay. got to have a bit of a relationship with him that through that, and then um, you know, and then obviously you know I was there for his Hall of Fame thing. And he, Cal comes back a, a fair amount. He has a lot of different projects he works with. He, I talked to him for this book. I talked to him at length for this book as well. There's a chapter. Of, he's probably, it, it's funny, when they asked me to do this, and again, I was supposed to order, at least get a real tight order of the first few, and I was stuck because you, you say that, you know, you think of, of Cal Ripken, but a lot of people in Baltimore, when they think of the Orioles, they think of Brooks Robinson. And so Brooks Robinson and Cal Ripken Jr. are 1-1A one one for the most important Orioles. I mean, if you have a Mount Rushmore of two, <laughs> yes. it's those two guys. And you really, it's an argument upon uh, generational lines on who is the more important. The older generation, the guys in their, you know, 50s, 60s, and 70s, they'll tell you that it was that it was Brooks. Guys my age, you know, younger than 50, say 20, 25 to 50, they're going to say maybe Cal. So it was kind of a, a trade-off for me. So what I did, I chickened out, <laughs> and my first chapter is actually the Oriole Way, which is based on the, uh, the kind of foundation of, um, you know, how the Orioles built, you know, the great history and, and you know, the pitching, the defense, the three-run homer, the fundamentals, that kind of thing. And, and that was that became kind of the foundation for so many players beyond, you know, just the beginning. So, therefore, that was my number one. Right. I went with Brooks two, and then I came out and gave Cal three and then gave Cal Street four. <laughs> okay. And there are several other Cal uh, chapters, including a chapter on his father and uh, right. I mean, that chapter on him and his brother playing for his father. I hope to get a chance someday to interview Cal Ripken Jr. I hope it happens. I've interviewed some pretty interesting uh, celebrity guests, but that would be an awesome one to get a phoner with for sure. Or ever if I, uh, if ever he comes to Pittsburgh and you get that opportunity. The, I add my celebrity list all the time, Dan, and I tell you that would be just a phenomenal one. Because one thing that he does in that time of baseball, right before he retires to the steroid days, He's clean. He's somebody that we always can still look up to and not have that taint like so many baseball players of his time. Really, that... And, and, he, truly, and he truly was an ambassador for the game. I mean, obviously, you know, people talk to about what, what you just spoke about, but if you go even before that, you know, the strike in 94-95 in set so many people away from baseball. Right. And the question was, when would they return? Would they ever return? And then... You know, just a few months after that, in September of, of 1995, you have Rifkin breaking Garrett's record, which is one of the, the most you know coveted and treasured records in baseball history. Exactly. And he's breaking that, and it's and it's a it's a record that's not done by performance. It's just done by basically by showing up. It's a lunch pail performance, and I think that spoke to a lot of people. And he speaks about that and the importance of the streak and, and what it meant, what he thought it meant to people, and why it resonated then with with people, and why it resonates now. I mean, a lot of people will say. That he was, you know, he helped save baseball, and obviously that same mantle was thrown upon Sosa McGuire when they had the home run record. But now it looks tainted when you look back on it. So, I mean, I think a lot of people do point to to Cal as being, you know, if not a savior of the current game of baseball, certainly a tremendous ambassador for it. Now, Dan, uh, I know I don't. Th uh, it's funny. I was joking with the Red Wings author, the hundred things. I said. It, Game 7 against the Penguins is definitely in the top 100. I don't think We Are Family 1979 was in your top 100, was it? <laughs> oh, most certainly. Because it was I, I made sure to mention, oh, absolutely. I mean, each one of the, uh, in fact, in fact, number 23 and number 24 are losing to the Pirates Part 1 and losing to the Pirates Part 2. <laughs> um, because, because, you know, first of all, you have to look at the fact that the World Series, I mean, you're talking about six World Series for the Orioles. And obviously all of them are, are tremendous moments and important right. moments in history for the team. So you can't just you can't just forget about that and say, Oh well they lost, you can't look at that. But both of those series were, were ones that, you know, really do resonate years upon years later in baseball fans' minds. Yes, it definitely even does. Though it, you know, you know, even though though you know, maybe your team wasn't in it, you certainly remember those. 
basically because of the performances. But they, they both went to seven games. Um, so obviously, that's, right. you know, it's always a lot of fun. Um, the, you know, Roberto Clemente basically took over the 1971 World Series for the most part. I mean, and, and that was a tremendous World Series. Right. And then in 79, Stargell did the same. Um, and both of them, like I said, I mean, in 79, the Orioles were up three games to one. And, you know, and, and lost, lost the three in a row. And in 79, you know, the Orioles, I think that they almost took the, the Pirates for granted. I mean, in 71, they almost took the Pirates for granted because they were so good. They were the defending champs in 1970. They've been in the World Series in 69. And I don't think they really thought that the pitching that the Pirates were putting out there was, was going to measure up. The Orioles had four 20-game winners that year. And, you know, so that because they had such a great team, because they had a 20-game winner and didn't win the World Series, I think that's always going to be, you know, resonation in, in the Orioles fans' minds and, and really baseball fans' minds. People will always remember those. So, to me, you can't leave those out. They're exceptionally important, and they're top 25. Well, Dan, as you see, I have a lot of memories. There's a lot more memories of the Orioles. But you got to pick up the book, for sure, and check it out. And uh, so where's the best place we can find information on you, Dan? Uh, check out the book. Learn more about you, all the different places. Where can they go? Well, as far as, you know, Nationally, online, you can find it in a lot of different places. I mean, TriumphBooks.com has it. Uh, obviously, that's, that's the publisher. Also, Amazon.com. It's available there. It's available at BarnesNoble.com, Walmart.com. I mean, if you basically do a Google search of 100 Things Orioles, you can find it locally in the in you know in the Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia area. I mean, Barnes Noble covers it, carries it. A lot of different bookstores are carrying it. Um, and I'm doing you know appearances and stuff throughout the Mid Atlantic region. So that's kind of a cool thing. Uh, but really, it's, it's fairly accessible. I mean, like I said, if you just Google 100 Things Orioles and Connolly, you'll be able to find probably 10 places immediately you'll be able to purchase it from. Because people always go to the beach, Dan, that people that are not from Baltimore are Baltimore Oriole fans because they spend some of their summers listening to Orioles games. And then they might not have a good year of a team. And especially if the Pirates are in a different division the Orioles never play them, there are fans of Orioles all over the country for sure. And especially because of, uh, you know, going to the beach. <laughs> so I don't know if you ever thought of that before, but that's something that was interesting for sure. So, Dan, thanks for calling, and uh, really enjoyed the conversation. And we'll see, and uh, I didn't bring up anything about the new Orioles, but that was exciting last year, and we'll see what they do this year. Possible. Absolutely. That's one of the great things about the, the, the book, too, is that it's, you know, we're at a situation where really there's a whole lot of interest in the Orioles. They won a division last year for the first time in 17 years. Lots of, of interest in them. So this seems like a real good timing for the book as well. Exactly. Well, thanks for calling, Dan, and best of luck. All right. Take, take care. care. Okay, you. bye. You're watching The Neil Haley Show and listening to Author's Corner, and we'll be back in just a moment with another great guest. Hi. My name's Jim Corns, and this is John Bauer, and we're paramedics with Tri-Community South EMS. This year, EMS Week is May 17th through May 23rd. Tri-Community South EMS would like to use this week to start our campaign on distracted driving. Distracted driving has been called an epidemic. Unfortunately, many of us drive distracted. So what is distracted driving? It is driving while engaged in any activity that could divert a person's attention away from the prime task of driving. Texting, making phone calls, putting on makeup, reaching for objects, Changing the CD or radio channel is part of an endless list that put us at risk. The following statistics should make each of us think about making changes in the way we drive or ride in a car. In 2012, over 3,000 people were killed and 421,000 were injured as a result of distracted driving. In 2011, it was estimated that a typical daylight moment, at least 660,000 cars were being driven by drivers using handheld cell phones. 40% of teenagers have been in a car with a person using a cell phone while driving in a way that put others in danger. Driving while using a cell phone reduces the amount of brain activity devoted to driving by 37%. Change the way you drive. Speak up for your safety. Drive without texting or talking on your cell phone. Make calls or texts prior to driving. Pull over to a safe location to text or check emails. Stop texting or talking on cell phones to others that are driving. It all starts with you. In honor of EMS Week, Tri-Community South would like to thank and recognize our staff for the work they do in keeping our community safe. For more information on Tri-Community South EMS, 
our CPR classes, or our Speakers Bureau. Visit tcsems.org. back to the Neil Haley show and it's interesting uh, doing this mass TV tapings for about six weeks because I just love doing it and, and dual broadcasting it on radio syndication across the world and television syndication across the world we have to bring the local feel back and it's so exciting uh, to welcome the program Selena Schmidt she is the community coordinator for Pittsburgh from PBS kids marketing and communications Selena thanks for calling and how are you you know, was, me on. Oh, I'm excited to have you have you back, have you on. And uh, I remember years ago, uh, we were doing a lot of things with uh, working with PBS Kids and different things like that with different projects. What are some new things going on, Selena, that you can tell us about? Um, well, simply having a person from PBS on the ground here in a local market is a brand new thing. Now, we count on all of our stations to do uh, heavy to build on the screen and take it out into our communities, making sure that we can support all children and make sure that all children have a good chance of learning all the way around. And so for us to have an actual presence in a community, in addition to all the things that we make nationally, is a, is a real change of pace. And so it's interesting. Now you're bringing more national feel uh, and how amazing PBS Kids to the Pittsburgh area and doing it in lots of different uh, PBS uh Groups, uh, that, so WQED now having that opportunity. What does how's that change things? Having someone right in this area for sure for PBS Kids. Well, one of the things that it does is it does bring Pittsburgh to a, a more prominent national focus as right. well, and that's an important thing I don't want to miss out on telling the story of. Um, Pittsburgh is one of the most innovative learning communities that we have in the country. The number of organizations and commitment and really commitment by every sector that we have here for our children is remarkable, and the innovation happening here is top-notch. And that's one of the reasons why PBS came here, not only to support, but also to be part of that learning process, to see what is happening, how is it happening, how is it most effective, how can we not only be additive, but how can we also learn? That's tremendous. And, uh, and you're right. What, what we were able to do in the Pittsburgh area education-wise with kids is, is phenomenal. And there's tremendous resources uh, all over with our cultural uh, district type stuff and different museums and all these different things. So tell us specifically some things, especially bringing that national, national view of PBS kids to Pittsburgh. And I, also highlighting Pittsburgh, what's going on with you right now? Right. So from one of my, my primary objective is to look at areas of real authentic need within the community to see how we're meeting that how, and where we may be missing it, how we can do more. In particular, I found three places that I'm working in conjunction with other organizations here as well as the station. Um, I'm looking at three primary areas of need that we've identified. Um, first and foremost is in that connection for where the kids are during the day. You know, more than 60% of the kids here in Allegheny County spend their day with someone other than the parents um, before they're in school. Are we really meeting the needs for those care providers that we have? Have we found a way to access them and be able to bring them tools that they can use in their homes to help support their work with our children? That's a key area of focus that we're really, uh, on the national level now, looking to turn and wheel and spend, while we do a lot with parents and with formal education spaces, what do we do about that child care space in between uh, and putting a lot of focus there? So we'll be doing a partnership here with a few organizations to do a deep dive and create some brand new tools for PBS kids nationally to distribute across the system here in Pittsburgh. Very so good. A big project. So you're really looking at child care, what, how kids are being serviced in specific ways from schools to daycares, different places where you guys can provide that need and that help in that process for teachers and also... Uh, uh, preschool teachers and things like that. Am I correct in that? Right. Yeah. And not just on, not just in the screen environment. We we need to know that we have a lot of success with the characters that we bring to life and the way that we relate and do education on screen. But there's a whole process about taking taking that screen engagement and taking it back into the home, into the community, into parks. Uh, we really see what we do as watch, play, explore, and share. 
and that's the philosophy that we want to bring. How can we help people by engaging kids in the, in the characters and the ideas that we bring to life and then help them translate that into their lives, these successful strategies? And so we're looking at that with the care provider um, role in particular. So you're looking at parents as well in this process. But Absolutely. It, it, I mean, and that's the, the most, the they're, they're the number one educator. Selena, so it's it's got to be an important part of this process for them to be involved, especially with look at PBS and how our kids grow up with PBS from uh, okay. from Sesame Street uh, to other shows that are on PBS. Uh, you know, it, it's just it, we keep we keep that channel on. So you need to engage with them to help parents and caregivers have the ability to take what they're watching on TV, their children, their young children, and connect it to other opportunities, especially in places of need. So that, that that's on that's what's on that's when they watch TV, they watch PBS. They're not watching other things that are not very, really educating them for sure. And we think, you know, part of it is making sure that we model, but also that we give good strategies. And they're short and they're convenient. We know lives are really busy and you have a lot of things yes. happening at any given time. But if we can help you, so take, for example, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, which is the new extension uh, of what Mr. Rogers had done in the past. It's just today we watched Mr. Rogers, they're watching Daniel Tiger. Um, Daniel has a ton of... Uh, emotional and uh, social emotional development strategies, including songs. So we know all grown ups and all kids sometimes struggle with emotions. Yes. And little ones, before they have language, it can be even harder. So we have, so there's a song that Daniel um, learns when he gets frustrated about when he's so angry he wants to roar, he takes a deep breath and counts to four. I know this well. I have, I have five kids of my own, Selena. I know it as well watching that. Yes, yes. It's great. Yeah. And it's great to see the spinoff of Mr. Rogers and especially being a local thing. It's, it's fantastic for mm -hmm. Pittsburgh and it's such a great show. Well, and you know, today is the Emmys. I, mean, I want to take a minute to shout out to the Fred Rogers Company because in a, not only have they gone beyond um, the work of just the Fred Rogers show, they've taken those philosophies, that care, that skill, that love that Mr. Rogers had for children and for families and brought it to now three shows that are on PBS, all of which are up for Emmys this year. Um, they're actually out in L.A. right now. We expect they'll bring a whole bunch for Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood for a great um, a math program called Peg Plus Cat, which has got a spunky, dynamic, strong female character. And then for Odd Squad, which is their brand new show, uh, which is live action, um, kids almost like Men in Black, but solving problems with math. Um, which... My daughter loves it. My oldest daughter loves Odd Squad. Loves it. Fantastic. Yeah, so uh, I didn't know that that was uh, based on the Fred Rogers Company. That's awesome. I mean, it's great to, to see... Uh, new PBS shows and the pop popularity. My daughter wants to DVR every one of the Odd Squads. Yeah, well, I mean, and again, it just goes back to the lot of Pittsburgh. We had a, I was just in D.C. yesterday um, for the week, and we had a big conversation about uh, how are we reaching Latino families and making sure that we're being representative. And when we did our research work just this past year on um, talking with Latino moms and um, what's important to them, we picked three cities in the country to go to. That was South Florida, Los Angeles, and we picked Pittsburgh. Um, again, just looking at here being the center for uh, it's such a wonderful center to learn from and grow at nationally. Any new projects that are coming up? You tell me about all the different partnerships. Is there anything that uh, families could be looking towards right now? Uh, what you're doing uh, with the uh, marketing communications? Anything uh, coming up? Any activities or programs? Well, I, I'll, uh, I can give you some things that are out there that parents should definitely grab hold of. We have just updated our Play and Learn app for phones, which is free, and it gives strategies to help engage your children in learning activities during waiting times, like at a restaurant, in the grocery store, on the bus, in the park. Uh, it's wonderful. I love it. It's awesome. There's a companion called um, Parent Supervision that can actually tell you what your children are learning and playing um, while they're on TV as kids. So you get a sense of what, the, what skills they're tackling. You can also turn the screen off from your phone if they've <laughs> had too much time on, which is pretty fantastic. Of course, our, our show, Daniel Tiger, has a brand new um, app that's come out, too, this, in the past few weeks. Um, but, I also, but I can give you a little heads up. 
uh, one of the things I was doing in D.C. was talking to the producers of all of the books that, you know, um, whether it be digital uh, or on screen. And I can tell you we're really excited to announce that there'll be two new shows coming this year for us, um, one of which focuses on nature and getting outside and playing in the outdoors, and the other is about exploration and space. Uh, which I'm, right. I'm kind of a space nerd, so I'm really geeked about that. <laughs> well, my daughter is into science big time, and uh, she's uh, she attends uh, Pine Ridge in, in the Pine Ridge School District, and she just oh my gosh, science really into science. She's so knowledgeable, and uh, you get these science kits going and stuff like that. She hears about space. I'm sure she'll be DVRing that next. Isn't it amazing what kids do? And, and I'm happy when I'm hearing the shows she's DVRing. Because anytime it's on PBS, I don't have to worry about it. And that's what families have to know. Keep their uh, keep uh, television, especially for children's programming, always on PBS for sure. Absolutely. And, and, and if, if you're in a space where you're not sure or you don't have a cable provider, there is the PBS Kids Video app, which is free and you can watch on there. And we also have launched it. We just in the last few months launched a YouTube channel as well. So there are a number of ways to access PBS Kids. Well, I'm glad because we know that we've got all kinds of families out there. I'm glad you're talking because you know we're ta you're doing this as a local interview for television, but for my syndication, it's going out all over the world, so people can go ahead and and really uh, check out PBS all over. So, where's the best places uh -huh. we can find information on you, Selena, uh, about PBS Kids and what's going on in Pittsburgh? Is it to go to WQED? What's the best place for our mm -hmm. local audience mm -hmm. and everybody to go? Yeah. WQED has a fantastic community engagement program. Well, I'm, I'm proud that this is my hometown, and I'm proud this is our hometown station. They just do a wonderful job engaging with the community. They do training for educators literally across the state how to incorporate our education materials into the classroom as well. Um, so definitely the QED website. Um, if you're not in the local listening area, pbskids.org and pbsparents.org. Uh, which will also give you lots of activities that are connected to the things your kids are seeing on screen so you can really do that watch, play, explore, and share in the learning. Well, fabulous. I'm so happy to be back working with PBS and WQED to promote the, the, what's going on. Once I had to contact you guys back, Maria, and said, Maria, by the way, uh, I'm going more the local talk show route for television. Can I have guests? She said, sure, and I was so excited because I looked Again, the shows you're talking about, Selena, are the shows that my daughter watches. And if I can promote them in any way and help in any way, that's fantastic for sure. And I know social media-wise, QED has lots of places to go with social media, Facebook, Twitter, all those different places. And same with PBS Kids. So I'll be following them on my Twitter and, and make connections. And uh, best of luck, Selena, with what you're doing. You're doing tremendous things. And when there's something new, let me know. And you come back on the show to promote it, especially the new shows when they come out, okay? Fantastic, thank you, and I, I'm glad to I'm glad to talk to you as a PBS kid, but also that you're passing that tradition down. So thank you very much. You're welcome, Selena. Thanks for calling, and best of luck.